Hi everyone, I'm here to talk to you today about solubility and solutions. A solution is an example of a homogeneous mixture. And not only that, it's actually synonymous with a homogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture, which means that the, they are one and the same. And if you remember from previous lessons, a homogeneous mixture is uh, a mixture, so the components are physically combined, but you can't tell that there's more than one thing there. You can't see the difference. So what does that mean about solution? How can we tell if something is a solution? Solutions are made of two parts. There is a solute, which is the smaller component. That's the part that gets dissolved. And there's the solvent, which is the part that does the dissolving for us. For our purposes, we mainly talk about water, but the solvent is whatever you have more of. So what does that mean? Why do solutes even dissolve in solvents to begin with? So as I talk, I'm gonna have you, and I'm gonna mute this, I'm gonna have you watch what's happening on a molecular level around when salt dissolves in water. So here's a salt particle and it's a crystalline solid and it's made of sodium ions, the Na plus and the chloride ions, the Cl minus. And when we shake our salt shaker into our container of water, the water molecules actually get in between the different ions and they surround them. So you can see the water molecules here surrounding that chloride ion and they're gonna come in and they're gonna surround this sodium ion and this is called dissociation. And you can see an, a picture of that to the right. So what's happening is this crystalline solid is actually being separated into its ions and the, uh, each ion is surrounded by water molecules. That's dissociation. This also happens to things that aren't, don't make, aren't made up of charged particles. Sugar molecules will, get, will break apart from the sugar crystal and then also become surrounded by water molecules. So this doesn't just happen for things that are made up of charged ions. An important thing to remember when talking about solubility is that like dissolves like. Solvents and solutes must have similar properties in order to form a solution. An example is water and salt are both polar molecules. And you might remember the term polar from last year in biology. Oil and water, however, don't mix. Oil is a nonpolar substance, while water is polar. So the oil will sit on top of the water in a layer because like dissolves like, and these are not alike. Well, what are some different factors that affect the rate that this occurs? So the rate at which all those salt, those salt particles become their ions and are surrounded by water, that process of dissociation, well, what, if, what affects that? The first thing is temperature. As molecules start moving faster, the temperature increases. And when the molecules move faster, this is gonna make something dissolve faster because they're gonna collide into each other more often. And when that happens, they're more likely to spread apart and be surrounded by water. Agitation is also when you are stirring or shaking. So if you ever try to make a powdered lemonade drink and you go and you have to stir and stir and stir and stir and stir, it helps it dissolve it a little quicker. Well, when you stir, this is making it dissolve faster because of more collisions between the particles. And the more times those particles bump into each other, the more likely they are to dissolve. They have to be in contact in order to dissolve. So you are increasing the number of contacts when you are increasing temperature and increasing agitation. Well, how could we do this with surface area? Well, if we increase the surface area by grinding up salt into a powder, now you have smaller pieces, so there's more surface exposed to the solvent. How could that make something dissolve faster? Right, there's more collisions, and more collisions means a faster rate. A very important question that always gets asked is how much solute can, dissolve, can get dissolved into a solvent? Well, solubility is defined as the quantity one of one substance that will dissolve into a given quantity of the other at a given temperature. So solubility changes with temperature. So when you're looking at the solubility of something, lots of times we look at it at room temperature, that's our standard, but it could be at any given temperature, there would be a different standard. But what factors directly affect solubility? Well, it could be the identity of the solute or the identity of the solvent. And that goes into that like dissolving like. If they're unlike each other, then there's, that's gonna affect the solubility, right? And the temperature is another component. 
So let's take a look at temperature. If I take a look at the graph at the right, there's two different lines. There's a line here in black for sugar, and there's a line here in red for salt. The line is, is graphing as the grams of solute in 100 grams of water, so the solubility of each component in water at different temperatures. So we notice that salt doesn't change very much. It does change a little bit. If you notice, if you look at the gap between the, the line and the 50 marker at the beginning and the end, the salt did increase in solubility a small amount. But sugar really did increase a lot. So at zero degrees Celsius, you could get about 175 grams of sugar in 100 grams of water. But if I boil that water and I get the water at 100 degrees Celsius, right before that boiling occurs, because once it boils, you're not going to get much in there. But once the boiling occurs, sugar can actually dissolve at almost probably around 460, 465 grams in the same amount of water. So we are increasing how much sugar we can fit into that container of water if we increase temperature. Now looking at this graph, is it possible to dissolve the same amount of salt in water as you can sugar in water? Right, you can't. You can't dissolve the same amount of salt. More sugar fits in a given amount of water at the same temperature than salt does. Well, what else can be dissolved in water? We've spent some time working on the water quality reports of our town. So some of those things that are tested are heavy metals, molecular compounds, and gases. These things can also be dissolved in water and can pose hazards to our health. So metals could be iron, potassium, calcium, magnesium. These are the ones that are good for us. They are important for oxygen transport or creating nerve impulses or ingredients in, the bone, in our bones. Or it could be important in the production of ATP, which is that energy that you learned about last year in biology. But some metals are harmful to us. And those are our heavy metals, the ones that have higher masses than the ones we've previously talked about. So they're gonna be found on the bottom half of the periodic table. Three examples of that are lead, cadmium, and mercury. These will bind to proteins and inhibit them or prevent them from, from performing their job. So can you remember from biology class what proteins are used for? Yeah, they help build our muscle. They can also hurt the liver, kidney, and brain. So lead, it was used in the past for weights for fishing and additive for paint and in some water pipes. In mercury, it can be used as a silent light switch. We used to use it in thermometers and it can also be used as an antiseptic or a fungicide because it's so toxic. Hat makers would actually paint it on hats for that reason. And that's one of the reasons we have this Mad Hatter character. His hat was painted with um, mercury and it made the people go crazy. It created some brain damage. So he was the Mad Hatter. It can also affect numbness, the staggered walk, and tunnel vision. Cadmium used to be used for photography and paints and batteries and tobacco smoke, but unfortunately it can replace the calcium in our bones and cause very painful bone disorders. Heavy metal removal. Heavy metals are very hard to get out of ecosystems and as well as treat in humans. They travel between organisms and therefore they can be found everywhere in polluted areas. So our best solution is to start by using green chemistry and therefore not polluting in the first place. We're gonna be talking about green chemistry in, in future classes, but the bottom line is you prevent the pollution during the process versus waiting for there to be an output that you're preventing. Molecular substances can also dissolve in water even though they don't produce ions. And we talked about that before, like sugar and ethanol. Gases can also fall into this category. When a gas dissolves in water, the opposite happens with temperature. As you increase the temperature, the solubility of the gas actually decreases because the gas wants to escape the surface of the water and come out of the solution. So temperature affects the solubility of oxygen by as the temperature increases, the solubility decreases. So that's very different than the solids we've seen before, whereas the sugar, if you were to compare that, when we increase the temperature for sugar and water, the sugar was more soluble. So let's think about how this would affect fish. Think about the fish kill we were talking about before. What do we need, what do fish need oxygen for? As temperature increases, what happens to the amount of oxygen dissolved in the water? And as temperature increases, do fish become more or less active? 
A hint here is that they are cold-blooded creatures. They thrive in a cold environment. Is there a problem with this? We're going to be revisiting these answers during one of our discussions this year.